Welcome to episode 242 of Real Health Radio. You can find the show notes and the links talked about as part of this episode at 7. So the word all spelt out, S-E-V-E-N hyphen health dot com forward slash 242. Before we get started, I want to just mention that I reopened my practice to new clients last week. I specialize in helping clients overcome eating disorders, disordered eating, chronic dieting, body dissatisfaction and poor body image, exercise compulsion and overexercise, and also helping clients regain their period. If you want help in any of these areas or you simply want to improve your relationship with food and body and exercise, then please get in contact you can head over to 7-health.com forward slash help, so H-E-L-P, and you can read about how I work with clients and apply for a free initial chat. And the address again is 7-health.com forward slash help, and I've also included it in, in the show notes. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Real Health Radio. I'm your host, Chris Sandal. I'm a nutritionist that specializes in recovery from disordered eating and eating disorders, or really just helping anyone who has a messy relationship with food and body and exercise. And today on the show, it's a guest interview, and my guest today is Denise Bossart. So Denise is an award-winning poet, writer, photographer, and artist. She is a certified meditation facilitator and a contemplative artist uh, art teacher. She is an information technology professional working for a large urban school district. Denise holds a BA in chemistry, an MS in computer science and a PhD in developmental neuroscience and she is a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. Denise spent her adulthood healing herself from the traumatic impact of the sexual abuse she would had on her life and she is not a mental health professional. She is a thriver who has traveled a healing journey and is able to share a personal guided experience for readers to find and engage in their own journey to healing and becoming a thriver. Whether writing on overcoming trauma in her nonfiction work or recasting her real life experiences into award-winning dark urban fantasies that she's done in four novels, so Glamorous, Beginnings, Return and Readings, uh, Denise attacks the dark side of things with courage, fearlessness and compassion. So Denise reached out to me last year. She had found me because of the interview I had done with Beverly Engel, so that's episode 227, and Denise had written a book about all the things that she'd done to heal from her childhood sexual abuse, and she wanted to send me a copy of the book, and I read the book and thought it was fantastic, and so I invited her onto the podcast to discuss it. And while there are many aspects of this conversation that are specific to recovering from sexual abuse, much of it, or even most of it, is fairly universal, or, or at least can be applied to healing from many things. So whether that be an eating disorder, or dealing with uh, lifelong body insecurities, or dealing with addiction, or trauma of all kinds, or even if you feel like you are a fairly well-adjusted human being and haven't experienced your fair share of knocks, then there is still plenty of ideas here that can make your experience of life even better. So if the thought is, I haven't dealt with sexual abuse, so this episode isn't going to be relevant to me, then that is incorrect, and you will still get a lot out of this. Now, obviously, this episode comes with a trigger warning, as there are many sensitive topics that we cover, so sexual abuse and incest and suicidal ideation. So if these are topics you have difficulties listening to, then please look after yourself. But despite these dark parts, this is a hugely positive and uplifting episode. And it's incredible to just hear the transformation that Denise was able to make and, and that these kind of transformations are possible. As part of the intro with Denise, I talk about what we're going to cover during the conversation. So I won't mention it a second time. You'll hear it in a moment. One thing that does get mentioned a number of times in the conversation is Larry Nassar. So Nassar was the US gymnastics physician who sexually abused gymnasts over a number of decades. There is a podcast called Believed put together by NPR all about the case that is obviously horrible and, and gut-wrenching to listen to, but is also an incredible deep dive into the case and, and what happened. So if you know nothing about it and it's something you want to know more about, then you can check out that podcast. It's called Believed. 
I will be back at the end with a recommendation, but for now, let's get on with the show. Here is my conversation with Denise Bossart. Hey, Denise, welcome to Real Health Radio. Thanks for chatting with me today. Good to be here, Chris. Thanks for having me. So I'm really excited to be speaking with you, and we're going to talk a lot about your book, which is Thriving After Sexual Abuse, Break Your Bondage to the Past and Live a Life You Love. And it's a really fantastic book and one I would highly recommend to listeners to check out. And it covers the activities that aided you in your healing journey. So it's a like part memoir or your story. And it's also a very practical book with lots of ideas and questions and resources that others can turn to. So yeah, really today is us just going through your, your journey and many of the areas covered in the book. And I guess just to start with like, how long had you wanted to write this book? Like, was this a long time coming or was it more like a, a recent thing and you then actually started as soon as it became apparent that this was something you wanted to do? It was a long time coming. Um, I actually started my serious healing journey work when we were living in Florida um, and I was out of school, you know, a career person and I had started doing some yoga and doing that yoga work really opened up a lot of things for me to understand my body and the memories my body was holding on to and those started coming up and started releasing and to sort of deal with that what was coming up I started writing poetry about my abuse yeah. and it was anything from you know the memories of what I had as a child up through what I was going through then and it continued into being able to write about my healing journey and at that time which was many years ago I was just happy to get those stories out and yeah. my husband when he read them he's like this would be really helpful for people if you would share this and back then there was no such thing as self-publishing and I was like, no, there's no way I could get anybody interested in poetry about abuse. Come on. Um, though I thought it would be helpful. I just couldn't imagine how that would happen. And yeah. so many years forward, it came to a point where my husband over the years would say, you know, you really should share your, your ideas about what you're going through and what you've been able to do. And for me, I, at the time, the only thing I really thought of was a memoir. And as a survivor of trauma, my brain had been affected that I didn't really have a way to connect the abuse events into my timeline of my regular life. You know, that's something that just happens when you dissociate those memories. And so I didn't have a way to sit down and write my story, quote unquote, about my life and what had happened. So, you know, I kind of pushed it aside again. And then the story of Dr. Larry Nessar, the U.S. Olympic gymnast um, doctor came out yeah. and how he had used all these women and that just cracked my heart open. And I thought, man, somebody should do something to help these people, these lovely ladies that had been abused by this one man. And that's when I started to think, you know, I don't have a way to write a memoir, but I could write about what I've done to help myself, to help my healing happen. And maybe I could share that out. And maybe that's the story that needs to be told. That's the book that needs to be written. The book that I wish I had had when I started my healing journey. So it was a long time building with this concept of somehow maybe my story could be helpful. And then this drive that came into me when I heard about this story and that just made me want to do something. Yeah. And did the Larry Nassar case, did that like re-traumatize you in a sense? And, and, and it was very difficult for you to read about that case or it sounds weird for me to say this, but or was it kind of positive in the sense of like that just lit something in you and it's like, right, I need to do something? It was a little bit of both, to be honest. I mean, it's always painful to hear when other people have been hurt and especially a situation like that where he impacted so many girls and women and it was an institutionalized effort to hide it. You know, there was layers in there that made it much more painful to see and hear about but it was mostly, like you said, it just lit a fire in me to say, I've, I've got something I can share and I can, I think I know how to pull it together and write it. And, and I'm just hoping you know, it'll get in the hands of the right people and that it could help them. Nice. And I mean, you touched on your poetry there as well. And I mean, you've included a lot of that at the, uh, in the book as well towards the end. And it is just like 
both beautiful and, and heartbreaking to read. And I could imagine for reading that how at the time it may have been very cathartic to write it, but also how you could just be falling to pieces writing those things. Yeah, it was interesting because, you know, I had the support of this yoga practice that was so critical. It was one of the, the foundational pieces towards my healing. And I would go to the beach and in the morning would be writing beach poems, light, happy, fun beach poems. And then in, to balance that in the counter that in the evenings it would come out of me all of these stories about my abuse. So it was really interesting that I had sort of a an, an natural balance happening during that experience that I'd be writing really nurturing, supportive poetry that I actually published in another book of beach poems and then this counter with this catharsis and it's somehow your mind does you know some amazing things to help you when you're not even sure how to help yourself sometimes your mind can kick in and do some great things for you yeah and you you also touched on something there which is a facet of, of so many people who suffer sexual abuse or abuse of many different kinds at a young age is that memories get blocked out or hidden or this uh, just like traumatic amnesia and so what was your experience like with this like when did you start to remember parts of what happened to you so it it was something that I think my mind hid for me my entire childhood I don't remember when my abuse started it was with my maternal grandfather but I just remember how tall I was compared to the adult and I was a pretty small person, so I think it was pretty young when it started. And it didn't stop until he died um, when I was a freshman in high school. And during that time, I, I didn't really remember the events as, as they would come and go. These events would happen intermittently often during the summer when we would be dropped off to spend, you know, some vacation at my grandparents. And so in between those times when I was exposed to the abuse, it, it just was pushed back for me. And, and a little bit escaped because I had this reoccurring nightmare of a monster coming out of a dark hole in the wall of my room to come get me. So my brain was aware of it to some extent and expressing that, but mostly I just locked it down. But as soon as he died, when I was in high school, it was like the lid came off. And all of a sudden I had body memories, I had flashbacks, I had everything coming up. And you can imagine, you know, you're a teenager and you've got all this other stuff going on with hormones and fitting in with your, your peers. And there was this thing that came up and I had always felt different. I had always felt ashamed and different, but I, you know, I was too young to understand why or how. And then all of this came up and then it's like, oh my gosh, I have, a, my, my brain told me you have a reason to be feeling this way, but it didn't make me feel better and made me feel worse. Because now, instead of feeling like I maybe wasn't like everybody else, I knew I wasn't. And I felt like I knew I should be ashamed. And when those memories first started to, to surface, were you accepting them in terms of this is actually what happened? Or were you like, what is, what is this thing? I don't quite understand it. It, it felt... Like it, it resonated with all these weird feelings I had had. It sort of clicked. It made sense why I was terrified of him, why I never wanted to be around him. I was never trying to be alone with him. I try to find any excuse not to be around him. And I just felt icky. You know, usually you're like, Grandpa, run and hugs and loves. And this was like, keep the man as far away from me as possible. Don't let me sit by him at the Christmas dinner table. You know, so I just had all of these feelings. And when I remembered, they just made sense. But um, they didn't help me heal in any sense other than recognizing, okay, now I understand why I felt this way, but I didn't know what to do with that. Sure. And you talk as well in the book about at a point as a teenager, like really changing and shifting. And was this at, at that point when your grandfather was, was passing away or had passed away and, and all of these memories had come back or, or that change in you as a teenager had started to occur earlier than that? I think that the change actually happened when the abuse started because I was really demonstrative, loving, you know, energetic, creative kid. And that personality sh uh, shift happened when I was young. And I, looking back, I think that's when the abuse started. And I actually have an older cousin who was also abused by my grandfather. And she, she's 10 years older than I am. And, and she, uh, and I had 
conversations about the experience. She was sort of my first person to confide in and to help me. But she said that she saw the personality change when I was little and thought to herself, he got to her too. She recognized it, but bless her heart. She was like, what, junior high, high school? There's no way she could have, you know, done anything to help me at that point. She was still dealing with her own issues, but she recognized that this dramatic shift happened um, and that that was due to the abuse happening. Yeah. And so when did you start your your healing journey of, of, of sorts? Like at, at what age did you think, okay, right, this is something that I want to deal with and, and maybe you didn't fully understand what dealing with would look like, mm-hmm. but when when did there become this idea of like, this is something I want to, I want to deal with and and come to terms with and and heal from. It wasn't until I was actually in college. Um, I just was overwhelmed with everything in high school. I didn't feel like I could tell anybody. I didn't feel like anyone could believe me. And then so in high school, I just immersed myself in activities and, you know, taking honors classes. I was in band, I was in basketball. I did everything that every minute of the day, um, would keep me occupied so it would never have a chance to come to the forefront of my mind. And so that's how I kind of dealt with it was to contain it. And when I got to college, I started dating a graduate student who was in, in AA. And so he talked to me about AA in the process of you know getting support for what he was dealing with and really encouraged me to go and find a counselor through the counseling department at my school and with his encouragement, with his example, and with the ability to be mature enough and independent enough that I could, you know, do that without feeling like everybody was going to find out, you know, it's a big, it's your, it's college now, it's a big place. And so I just decided, you know, I'm going to try this. I, I want things to change. I don't want to be miserable. I don't want to hate myself and my body. There's got to be something better. And so that's, that's when I started to reach out for the first time and try to get some help through therapy. And what were your your experiences like with with reaching out and finding a therapist and and how did that go for you? It was a little bumpy ride at first. Um, the first therapist I got connected with, I did not gel with her at all, did not click with her. I was dating two guys at the same time, um, unbeknownst to either of them. Not Not a good thing to do, not a good place to be for myself or for them, but that's where I was at that time. And she was very judgmental about it rather than saying, okay, how is this working for you? How is this making you feel? She just came across as being very judgmental about it. And I, I didn't need someone to judge me. You know, I was already judging myself for a whole lot of reasons and I didn't need that. So luckily there was another uh, counselor there that I could talk to and I really connected with her. And she's the one that actually got me connected with a women's group of survivors. And that was really the first time that I talked to someone who was a perfect stranger and a group of women who had gone through something similar to me, whether it was sexual abuse or rape or assault. There were people who had had the same experiences, were going through the same things. And some of those women were further along their healing journey. And I could actually get some hope that look, there's someone who has gone through what I have gone through and look where they are. I want to be where they are. I want, I want what they have. So it was very inspiring to have a, a therapist who I could work with individually, but also have this group of women that I could go to and really be f- feeling fully accepted that no matter what had happened to me, they understood and fully accepted it. Um, and I also joined Survivors of Incest Anonymous, which is the 12-step program equivalent to AA. And that was another amazing part of my journey because it was mixed group, all ages, men and women. And it's the first time I could ever imagine a man being abused because there were men there who had been abused by their mothers, had been sexually assaulted by, you know, members of their family. And to see that and realize that it wasn't just men perpetrating onto women, but all kinds of people on both sides had that experience. And so that was also very healing. And healing because, I mean, I imagine it's for for lots of different reasons, but, but one of the big ones being that I don't feel so alone with this anymore. I'm seeing that this affects lots of, of different people. 
and also some of the shame with it starts to fall away by being able to take what has been kept secret for so long and be able to, to speak about what had happened or how you've been affected and, and have other people in a room be able to hear you and hold that space for you and to kind of nod along because that's been their experience as well. Yeah, just a validation, just the acknowledgement validation, because I was so afraid of being rejected. When you feel that unlovable and full of shame, the last thing you want to do is set yourself up to be rejected because of the things that have happened to you, which as a child, you convince yourself that you caused. That's just kind of where kids' brains go because they have to find a way to manage the situation that they really have no control over. And so they develop in a sense that that's their fault, even though it is absolutely not their fault. That's just where a small child's brain goes. And to have all these people, men and women of all ages, talk about the challenges they had, talk about things that they could do to help themselves. And just, there was never a question that it had happened. And with Survivors of Incest Anonymous, what's really amazing is, you know, they basically say in their description of their group, it can only have had to happen one time, yeah. you know, and I always thought, well, I only have, quote, a few memories. So that must mean it wasn't a big deal. And why am I, you know, so upset about it? But hearing that and having people talk about it made me feel like, OK, yeah, this is legitimate. This is real. And these people see me and they are not despised by me. They aren't ashamed of me. They welcome me and they accept my story and they accept where I am in my healing process and they're going to encourage me in any way that I need to help support me in my healing process. Yeah. Yeah. And I can understand how, even if it happened just the one time, how devastating that can be and how much of an impact that would have. And also, as we talked about early on, because of how much memories are suppressed, you really don't know if it was the one time or it was multiple times. And so if if there's this feeling of, well, I can only remember one time, so that doesn't legitimize this as something that could have impacted upon me to this degree, like, like that, that's just not true. And it's the betrayal of trust that is so key to the experience. And, and, and my situation, that's really was what I felt was taken from me. You know, my childhood was taken from me. My sense of trust was taken from me. You're, you're a young child. Your brain is developing. You're learning to experience the world and understand what the world's about. And what I was taught was the world's a scary place and it can hurt you. And in fact, the people who love you can absolutely destroy you. And that's where I lived. You know, that was my worldview growing up. And so that's where the hypervigilance and the fear and the shame and all that came through because the message I received is you're unlovable, you're worthless, you deserve what's happening to you, and no one's going to come and help you. Now, my grandfather didn't you know, sit there and tell me these things, but his actions and how he went about them and how I felt when they were happening, it was you know, obvious to my intuitive, emotional self that that was what was going on. And to have that be what you learn about the world. I mean, I hear other people's experiences of their childhoods, and I just sit there and I'm amazed. I'm like, I, ha- I have no way of understanding what that's like, you know, because you, yeah. know, you, you have love and trust and people supporting you. And I had this vacuum. And in fact, it was like a reverse vacuum sucking you away from all the good stuff that you should be having as a kid and that safety and that feeling of, of loving support. And so that was part of getting over the shame through a number of the things that I worked through, learning to love myself and support myself and learning that I could feel lovable just because of who I was, regardless of anything that might've happened to me, getting to the place where I felt I could trust people and be safe around people, particularly when I wanted to be in emotionally or physically intimate situations. That trust is, is a big thing for people who have gone through this type of abuse. Yeah, totally. I mean, I remember in the book you talked about fearing happiness and, and fearing mm-hmm. happiness because it had become connected with the inevitable pain that would then follow. And to to live in that way, to, to fear happiness or to fear joy, I mean, that really completely taints your ability to have uh, a good life and to, to experience the, the better aspects of life. Yeah. And I think it was just part of that too was um, just afraid to open up to feel because if you open up to joy, you open up to other things. And yeah. 
the joy felt like it was in such limited supply. It, it was just swamped and overwhelmed with all these negative emotions. So it was almost like, you know, okay, joy sliding by in front of me. I don't want to connect with it. I don't want to spend too much time on the good things because that opens me up to feel all the negative stuff that'll just overwhelm me. Yeah. And, and I think you followed that up in the book of saying like it was, it felt safer to be numb than to, to feel the, the mix of emotions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know also you, you've studied, you've done a PhD in developmental neuroscience. Like what is your area of interest with this? Like was this connected to exploring abuse and how it affects the brain and function and development and that side of things or no, not connected at all? Initially it wasn't. Initially I was really trying to understand how to heal myself and my, my emotional self and my body self. But then as I started learning more about trauma and realizing that what I had experienced was trauma, you know, for a long time, it wasn't connected um, out in the world that this, you know, children who survived sexual abuse were trauma victims, just like people who come back from war, you know, in the same way. And and feeling that I could learn about trauma and inform my healing journey and in reading that, starting to understand how the brain processes memory, how the brain deals with uh, traumatic experiences and triggers. And so I I initially started in a different place, but then when I learned that there could be so much that the ability of the brain to deal with trauma and then how to heal itself um, with some work on my end, (laughs) that that really drew me in and really excited me based on my, my past of working in neurobiology and really appreciating that we've learned so much about neuroplasticity and how we can actually change the physical structure of our brains. That's really encouraging. It should very, be very encouraging to people who have had an, a variety of traumatic experiences that your brain can heal literally physically heal and also develop in a way that's going to take you into a place where you develop patterns that are positive rather than negative behaviors that are supportive and healing and having self-care rather than going in a direction that is negative. So it was something that kind of eventually merged together over time as I learned more and more about my experience and healing from my experience. And, and it was a ray of hope, like I said, that there was a chance that I could actually do the work myself and with a supportive therapist and other modalities to heal my brain and move forward. Nice. I mean, that's so great that you, you got to then in a sense, see that in advance, like you're, you're doing this research and, and it became an area of interest where suddenly you're like, Oh, okay. I can see what is possible here. And mm-hmm. yeah, I could see how, how beneficial that would be. And also just, like how much we have advanced in that area and, and so much of the research around trauma. I, I remember when they were first looking at the the ACE study and there was some completely misguided belief that incest happened in like one in one million or one in two million people, whereas that number is just so far off what they actually found to be to be true. And I would say whatever they have found statistically to be true or based on questionnaires, it's it's undoubtedly got to be higher because of the shame of people not wanting to admit it or the suppressed memories that mean that people don't even remember it. And so, yeah, it feels like over the last decade or a couple of decades, we've made a lot of headway in starting to understand trauma in, in all its different guises. And even in areas of, of practices that I used in my healing, like I mentioned yoga several times and meditation, there are people who are working with trauma-informed yoga and, and meditation because these modalities are awesome for healing, but for trauma victims, it can be very challenging to work with these. You know, like I said, in my body, all these body memories came up and there were certain poses that I was asked to do in class. I'm like, whoa. Um, no, I don't feel safe in this pose. It's terribly triggering. But luckily, I was able to communicate to my teacher and we worked around how to do some alternative things until I felt safe and could move into those spaces. But that's amazing to me that we've progressed enough that these um, um, very helpful, very healing modalities of yoga and meditation can also be done safely and with guidance from people who understand how to make those things work for people with trauma without re-traumatizing. Yeah. 
And so, yeah, I think what will be useful then is to just go through your your healing journey and, and touch on various things that you've done that have been been helpful. And I, I know we have already mentioned about therapy and finding a therapist and then the, the group therapy piece. I mean, what else would you add here? Like what else would you have for other people who are just starting out, who are either looking for a therapist or looking for uh, a group therapy situation, what, what advice would you have? Yeah, I, I think that um, it's good to understand kind of where where you're, you're trying to go, what you're trying to do. Um, I just want people to know that going into therapy does not mean you're going to have to go back and rehash and relive everything that you've gone through. That's not the real purpose of therapy. I know that's a misconception people have is I don't want to go to therapy because they're going to make me go through everything again. That's not what... The goal is the goal in my mind with the therapist who's is particularly if you find a trauma and informed therapist, the therapist who's worked with trauma, understands the approach to use. They're going to help you look at what you're doing now in the context and understanding of trauma and, and what it leads to. But they're going to point you to the future. You know, that's the goal is to not sit in the past and rehash it. You know, there's an acknowledgement. There has to be an acknowledgement that the abuse happened. And then the goal is to say, okay, what do we do from here? What are the behaviors that aren't working? What are the behaviors that are not um, letting you live your full authentic self life? And let's work to shift those things. Let's build some resilience with give you some tools to help you move forward. So I recommend people first thing, trying to find a therapist. There are a number of different um, online platforms now where you can find a, a therapist that could be uh, trauma trained so that you don't necessarily have to rely on the resources that are local to you. You can, you know, go through one of these websites and work with someone that's very specifically trained. And then um, that gives you the flexibility to go through maybe what I did to find the perfect person for you. You know, don't be afraid that the first person you connect with doesn't seem to be the person that's going to work for you. Don't be afraid to, to keep looking till you find the person that's going to really help you. So find someone who has experience in trauma and, you know, find someone that you can work with. And then if they know of some groups, then that's something I would encourage you to do at your own time as you feel you're ready to start working with your group. Because as I mentioned, I work with two different groups and it was unbelievably healing and helpful to get in a group, whether it's a same sex group or a mixed sex group, whatever you're um, comfortable dealing with. I think those are the first two steps to really lay a foundation and also to be resources as you try some of the other things that I did for my healing journey. That's a foundational piece you can come back because as you do some of these things, you're going to have challenges. Things are going to come up. You're going to be challenged by some of the work you're doing and you want someone you can go and touch base with and get some support. Yeah. And with the therapists that you've worked with over the years, what were there particular styles of therapy that you found to be particularly beneficial, whether that's, oh, I did EMDR or I did acceptance and commitment therapy or CBT or what, what were, uh, if there were any that stand out of like, this was really helpful, what, what were they for you? And I guess at the time I, I began my therapy work a long time ago. <laughs> so when <laughs> I first started, um, I, I don't remember that they really focused on a particular area. There's so much more available now. I think that I've learned about family systems and uh, I find that very helpful. I think that each person really needs to discover for themselves what can and cannot work for them. You know, it's an individual journey. And I think that everyone needs to kind of see what's going to work best for them. I, I think that anyone who is going to be able to work with you as a whole person, not just your mind, not just your emotions, not just your body, but an integrative approach, however that might manifest in these different modalities of, of therapy. That to me is someone who recognizes that my body is impacted, my emotions are impacted, my mind is impacted. Um, that to me would, would be someone that would work the best for me. And someone who is, you know, trying to help me be reflective, someone who's trying to help me self-evaluate, not, not in a judgmental way, but just exploring and saying, well, really, does this really working for me? And giving me the tools that I might not be aware of that I could use to help me move forward. So there, it does get a little confusing because there are so many um, names and acronyms and things. But to me, I think it, it's 
the relationship with the, the therapist and if they're providing you things that appear to be working for you. And, and it's an exploration to find what is going to work for you. And, you know, just keep looking for something that's going to work. It's got to be hard work and it may be uncomfortable. So you don't want to be, you know, running from one person to the next. But I think that if, if you have a trustful relationship with the therapist and they can bring tools to help you and you see change happening, then that's what's going to be the best outcome. Yeah, definitely. And I, I do. I think the the therapeutic relationship that you have with your your therapist is the most important thing. Like it, you're going to be opening up about things. You're going to be exploring tough parts of, of your life and the way that you think and emotions and all of these things. And so you want to have someone that you feel you trust and feel safe with and you have this, this strong bond with. And so, yeah, I think that is hugely important. I mean, one of the books I will sometimes recommend to clients is Bessel van Kolk's The Body Keeps the Score. And I quite like it because in the second half of the book, he touches on a number of different types of therapy that can be useful. And so clients can then have a read through of that and say, oh, internal family systems, that sounds really useful to me. Or EMDR sounds like something I'd like to explore or trauma-informed yoga sounds like something I want to explore. And so it, it kind of gives you a, a bit of a buffet of all the things that are available. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, the, the caveat I always add is that it's a pretty full-on book. And the first half <laughs> of it... It is. It is. I, I've read it and I, I absolutely agree that it's an amazing resource. It is kind of deep into uh, the neurobiology and the, the approach from a psychologist's perspective, but, you know, you don't have to understand all of it, you know, in the initial phases to get to the parts that you're saying that are really uh, going to touch people and, and say, oh, wow, that I, that really makes a lot of sense to me when I read that. And that that's the resonance you want when you can relate to something just by hearing about it or reading about it and saying, hey, you know, something about that. I don't even have to define what it is, but yeah. I really think that that's going to be something that makes sense to me in some way. So let me see if I can pursue that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, you can, you can basically flip to the second, <laughs> second section of the book and, and start there because I also think there's a lot of details of different people's stories of trauma in the first half of the book that I could also imagine could be quite difficult reading for someone. And yeah, if, if they're not ready to, to be going through that content, they can start with, as I said, the second half of the book, which is going to be much more specific of, of different modalities that could be helpful. Mm-hmm. And you also mentioned that there were many self-help books that were helpful for you and some that sort of jump-started your healing journey and then helped continue it on. So uh, I think you talked about like creating your own healing works library. And so maybe just share some of the books that were most useful for you. Yeah, I think that the first book I found, and I believe my cousin helped me discover this, was The Courage to Heal, which was a real eye-opener for me because here on the page, like you said, people's stories about what they were going through. And there were things that they recommended doing and approaches. And it really was the first time that I, in any way, understood that there were other people like me and to, and all their stories were slightly different, but you you know, you got the idea that these are people who had gone through these horrible experiences and they were working their way towards the healing for themselves. And so that I think is a, a wonderful book. Again, you have to be ready for reading about some other people's stories Um, But I think it's a real powerful book for people to understand how this could be done and recognize um, that there's healing and being able to witness other people's stories that are similar to yours. So that was one that I found was fortunate enough to find very early on. And then Beverly Engel, uh, who wrote the foreword to my book, she has a number of different books, but her book about shame, I wish I had found that many, many years ago, because it is so powerful. And she she's a survivor and she's a therapist. And she writes about the different ways that you can work towards self-care and self-healing, self-compassion, and really has suggestions for you and is so empathetic and so gentle in her writing. She just, you know, you just feel so supported and carried along by her as you go through the book. And so that was one that I found very powerful recently 
Um, and then Brene Brown's work, although it has nothing to do directly <laughs> with abuse per se, but it's, it's about uh, courage and being vulnerable and working through shame. And so I really enjoyed reading her books because there was, you don't have to go to resources that are just specific for trauma survivors. You can go to resources that are meant for other people that develop resilience for you. You know, I've, I've um, The Dance of Anger was another powerful book because, boy, I did have a lot of anger once I started remembering. So, um, and this is something that I think that working in groups who can recommend books to you or working with the therapist is also helpful. But I just kind of, um, when I heard about a book that sounded like it would, would be interesting, I, I would pick it up. And you just take what you can from the book. You don't have to to resonate with everything in a book. But, I, you know, for me, if I could find one or two things out of a book that maybe I put a, you know, a sticky on my mirror just to remind me of those things that the book um, was suggesting or bringing up, um, that would be something that would be powerful for me. And now, you know, we've got so many resources um, online. If you go in and search a book platform, they'll make recommendations based on what you've read before. So that's helpful. You can use that as a resource. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I know you talked about in the book of like creating affirmation cards based on quotes from the book and, and kind of using that, as you just said there, like a sticky to just kind of remind you of of what you've you've read and keep it front of mind. And yeah, I've had Beverly Engel on the podcast before. I think her book, It Wasn't Your Fault, is an incredible book and an incredible resource. Uh, and I'm also, yeah, a, a big fan of Brene Brown's work. And as you say, it's it's much more bigger picture, bigger picture, big, bigger picture, and more universal in terms of what she's talking about than than just trauma or just abuse. But I think she's got a, a wonderful way of writing and of of also speaking. There's a a seminar that she's done called The Power of Vulnerability that is on Audible. And it was between her writing um, The Gifts of Imperfection, which she'd finished and it had released just before Daring Greatly came out. And it's a, a six and a half hour seminar. And I've recommended that countless times to clients. I think I've listened to it you know, four or five times in total myself. And it's a really incredible resource. And I think basically any human being who listens to that, irrespective of what your your backstory is or life experience is, you'll get a lot a lot out of it. And that's kind of been my way of working through my healing journey is exploration, because I wanted more than just necessarily a therapist who could talk to me about things and help me in that way. I always felt that there were other things that I could pull in and continue my growth and my healing, like the yoga to um build my my relationship with my body and meditation to build relationship with my mind and all of these things that I was doing I was just exploring I didn't start off like the book you know here it's kind of like a little blueprint to help you and guide you and ask you questions but I just was exploring trying to figure out what it, what works for me what lights me up what gives me joy what makes me feel like I'm more fully myself and and doesn't and um, push me into that space of fear and shame, but brings me out of it. And, and that's what I really encourage people in my book. You know, my book's not the 12 step program to healing. It's just, Hey, here's some stuff that worked for me. This is why can you explore this? What else can you take beyond this into the spaces that you enjoy doing things that might be healing for you? Um, because again, everyone has a different story. Everyone has different things that they resonate with. And my idea about my healing journey was not just a one-stop shop, take a pill and you're done kind of thing. Medication can be helpful. Therapy can be helpful. Yoga, meditation, art, all these things, being in nature, whatever it is, you don't have to just do one thing or expect one thing to solve the problem. Sometimes you need to support yourself in multiple ways that work for you. And sometimes in your life, one thing's going to be really helpful. And at at a different point in your life, another thing might come up that's going to be really helpful and allow ourselves the fluidity and the dynamicness of our lives to be able to say, I can pull in the things that I need at this time and maybe challenge myself to explore another aspect that I wasn't able to do in the past, but now I'm ready. Now I'm resilient enough. I can move into this space and I can work through my fear and I can explore this space here. And, you know, and I love taking classes and trying something new because I never know what is going to resonate for me. 
and not be afraid of failing, not being afraid of doing it perfect, <laughs> but just say, I want to try it. Because if I open up to all these experiences, I never know when I'm going to find something that's just going to absolutely light me up and I want to be a part of my life going forward. Yeah. And yeah, thank you for saying that. Because I, I think sometimes you read a book, like your book is 200, 300 odd pages. And that's really, I don't know, 20 years condensed into <laughs> all of those pages. Yeah. And so I think you can get, you can kind of read that and think, wow, like I've just got to keep doing this thing and then this thing and then this thing and then this thing. And sometimes it might even just feel too simplistic. You're like, oh, you mean I just do these things and everything is solved? And you you really miss out the fact that you, as I said, you, you've concertinaed like 20 years or 30 years into the space of a couple hundred pages. And in that book form, it can feel much more straightforward or simple when in reality your experience was was anything but that. And that's often the case when working, working with clients, when they talk about reading other people's recovery stories online or hearing other people on podcasts talk about their, their recovery. And it's like, well, they're condensing a lot of things that have happened over many, many years into a 20-minute conversation or a, a couple hundred word blog post. And so, yeah, I think it's useful to hear that, that there are many ups and downs with this. There are things that you start and then they don't actually work. And then you come back to them five years later and you're like, oh, now I get this thing. Uh, but yeah, that it's not just this linear, uh, straightforward process. Yeah, and I think it can be overwhelming for people to say, well, what do I do? You know, for me, the thing is, get a therapist if at all possible that's your foundational piece and and going to support you through all the other work that you're going to be doing and yeah. then you know my book might be helpful courage to hear heal it wasn't my fault what, whatever you can start with but maybe pick one thing you want to try because we often try too hard to overcome to compensate for what happened to us and in our trauma and and push too hard too fast too strong and because we're, we're really and oftentimes desperate to get away from what's happening to us. So yeah. here's a chance for self-compassion. Here's a chance to be gentle with yourself and say, okay, let me kind of explore some of the possibilities by just, you know, reading about them, informing myself about what might be possible. And then I'm going to just say, okay, I'm going to be gentle. And I'm going to pick one thing to work with and explore and see where that takes me. And if I feel ready enough, I can do more. And so don't set yourself up for failure by thinking you have to make a checklist of all the things you got to do and schedule them and fit them in and figure out how you're going to push your way to healing. You know, this is a chance for people for maybe the first time in a very long time to say, you know what, I can be good to myself, kind to myself and set a little, the bar a little lower for, you know, where I need to go and to say, I'm going to take one step forward. I'm not going to jump on you know, the Boston Marathon and, and run, I'm going to take my one step forward and then the next, and we'll just slowly go forward and see where it leads me. And, and people have to know it's not get on the Audubon, drive 200 miles an hour and get to destination healing. It's going to be some days you feel like one step forward, two steps back. But I don't like to think of it in those linear terms. I like to think of it more as a spiral that yeah. you're growing, you're learning, you're healing, you're building resilience, you're, you're coming to understand your strengths. And as as things come back around again that you've experienced in the past, you're better able to deal with them. You have more capability than where you were in the past. So you don't have to feel like you're you're losing in this game of healing. It, it's, it's not something that you have to keep tally on for yourself and criticize yourself. It's just keep going forward and exploring what's available and, you know, being honest with yourself, which is critical, but also being gentle with yourself and being kind to yourself. You know, I read a meme recently and says that, you will talk to yourself more than you'll talk to any other person ever. So be nice, <laughs> be nice to yourself and, and also just be gentle and go where you can and be understanding about what your life is challenging you with, but make whatever tiny one step effort you can towards the direction you want to go in. And that will be the start to keep you going. Yeah, definitely. It reminds me of something. I can't remember where I heard this before, but it's like people, overestimate what they can achieve in a year and underestimate what they can achieve in five. And I, uh -huh. I think that that is, that is really true. And, and with a lot of this work, um, one of the things I talk about often with clients is it's kind of like compound interest. 
where mm. in the beginning it doesn't feel like it's making much of a of a of an inroad and then with time it starts to really pay off and you can then start to really notice some much bigger shifts as you get further along because you've you've learned so much more you understand so much more when you come with a new concept it fits into all of this uh, knowledge that you already have but when you're starting out you don't have any of those any of those things yeah i think starting out too that's a good point and, and starting out too you are just trying to kind of understand things you know yeah. it, it's you've got to like a, go through the acknowledgement phase and maybe a grieving phase and learning to see what's really going on because we've hidden so much from ourselves to protect ourselves. You know, there, there's a lot of behavior patterns we developed in response to the trauma that served us at the time. That was the best we knew at the time to do. But unfortunately, those behaviors have continued into our current life and now they may not serve us. And in fact, they may be very detrimental to the type of life we want to have, the type of relationships we want to have. So it's a slow kind of peeling of the onion to slowly discover what what you're actually doing to be able to recognize that, to be able to say, even if it's, oh my gosh, last week I did X, Y, and Z, I can kind of understand where that's coming from and why I did that, but I don't want to keep doing that. And then over time, it gets closer and closer and closer to the events that are happening to the point you're in the moment and you say, hey, I have a choice to react differently, to think differently, to do differently. And it takes some time to kind of compress that understanding and, and self-evaluation to the point that you can be present with it. And then you can step more into shifting away from it. So it, it is a process. It is, is a journey. It's a healing journey. And that's where we need to be gentle with ourselves. But it, like you said, it takes some time to kind of remove all the clouds <laughs> you know, that, that we've been hiding behind to get some clarity and some sunshine to come in so that we can start seeing things clearly and say, aha, now I can make those steps um, a little more quicker and make some um, advancements a little more quicker, bring in more things, because now I'm at a point that, you know, it can kind of accelerate a little bit. And that's, that's kind of what happened to me that, and you'll reach plateaus every so often, you know, make some progress, reach a plateau, and it feels a little frustrating, but that's, that's your mind, body, and emotions processing, and then you'll hit another growth spurt, you know. So it, it's something that kind of you just have to have faith in yourself and have that support that they can remind you of how wonderful you've been doing and what changes have been happening for you. That's why keeping a journal is great, right? Yeah. I think that keeping a journal is fantastic to write down where you are and what you're going through. And then you can look back over time. And then you think I have done nothing. I've made no progress. You can look back and you can read and go, wow. Oh my gosh, I have come so far. <laughs> yes, that is definitely an experience. I have a lot with clients where they can feel like, oh, things haven't changed. And then we're able to look back and there's like, oh no, things have really, have really changed. And I do, I, I'm a, a big one that your current state has a huge impact on on your memories and how you feel about mm -hmm. what's happened and so yeah if someone's currently in uh, a funk it can feel like nothing's changed but then another day when they're feeling better they they have much more perspective and much more perception that actually things have really shifted yeah so it's a good in your journal to write about the challenges but also write about the successes so that you can come back to that and you can see both you know the, oh i overcame that challenge and I'm in a place where that's not as much of a challenge now and you can also look back and say oh look at all these things that I did no matter how small they were you know some something you were grateful for at the time or something that happened that you really realized you were growing and changing all of those things are important to to document for ourselves because I love what you said that you know depending on where you are currently it, it sort of cast a light on the past in a different way and we need to give ourselves those moments to when we're looking back to say, hey, you know, this is the real situation at the time. And, and I can kind of ground myself in into what was really going on versus what I may try to remember based on where I'm coming from at this current moment. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a whole section in the book about embracing joy. And I know we've touched on a little bit of this already, but one of the things you talked about was joy in exercise or, or movement and, and using this as a way to get back into your body and to start really appreciating your body. So can you talk a little about this and, and how you used exercise or movement? Yeah, for me, it started with, with the yoga. Um, I really had developed a 
dislike or even hatred of my body. When I was in high school, after I remembered what had happened to me, I basically tried to become as androgynous as possible, kept my hair short, wore baggy clothing, and tr because as desperately as I wanted someone to uh, recognize me and be attracted to me, you know, you want to go out and have dates and, you know, get to know boys. And it was terrifying to think that someone would be attracted to me because the only thing that I really understood at, at a deep body level was the abuse. Yeah. And so I had just hated my body. I treated it like a machine, feed it, push it to the limit, use it, don't care about it. You know, just it was there to be serve my brain, basically. But then when I started doing yoga, that's when I really started slowing down and being present in my body. I had become so dissociated, dissociated because that's what I had to do when I was in the abuse in the moment, but dissociated because my disgust for my own body and shame of it, that I just never was like really physically present in it. And so I was learning that and learning to feel safe in my body, learning to feel I was in control of my body, that it was a safe place to, to inhabit, that it was um, strong and flexible and enjoying the feeling of that strength and flexibility and that trust in my body. And that yoga is what helped me develop that. And then, you know, going for walks or riding a bike or rollerblading, getting out and moving and, you know, all those endorphins coming around and all the brain chemistry that happens when you're exercising and getting oxygen in your brain, um, all of those things kicked in. And you know, just to feel that I could feel good in my body for myself, not for anyone that was going to be looking at me, but just feeling good in my body and exploring that and enjoying the feeling of, uh, like you said, of moving and, and um, being out in the world in that way. And it was something that I could do, you know, in a class I could do by myself if I wanted to walk or bike or whatever. And it was just feeling how that I could be safe and present and be joyful without anything negative happening because, you know, this was just me living and being present in my body. Nice. And I also remember you talked about it was some some kind of team sport. I can't remember if it was basketball or volleyball or, or whatever it was, but being part of the team and seeing how capable you were in your body, but also seeing that people were enjoying you being part of that team and it had nothing to do with how you look or the shape of your body or anything along those lines. It was just down to that they enjoyed you being being there and, and scoring goals or whatever whatever it was. Yeah, it was ultimate frisbee and you know a team of women and it was exactly that. It was just being strong and capable and um, there's something about being on a team, at least for me, where you have a goal and you're challenged and you've got to rise up together to meet this challenge and succeed, but it does individual contribution to the whole. And that took away the focus of, you know, feeling self-conscious and, and just having that support of people and doing something that was fun. You know, there's a lot of fun when you're doing team sports. And I think that was what was part of it too, is just, there was a lighthearted fun. And then there was this serious focus on competitiveness that this combination really helped me feel good about myself. And like you said, it wasn't about anything other than can I contribute to the team um, with my skills and that's all that was required and so it eliminated a lot of other baggage that a lot of times my brain would want to bring to circumstances or relationships because it wasn't about anything other than let's go have fun and, and be the best that we can be yeah and with the yoga I know you mentioned before that there were certain poses that would be quite triggering for you how was that for you when you brought that up to the to the yoga teacher yeah, it was, it was really terrifying to think that um, I would have to say something to someone. I, you know, he was still kind of a stranger at that time, but I, I wanted to do the yoga. I really wanted to do it because I was already feeling that, you know, it was going to be helpful. And so I just said, I, I need to talk to him because I, I don't want to feel like I'm going to stand out because he's got to talk to me individually and point me to do something. But I got to figure out some way to make this work. And we talked, you talked about statistics before about how frequently this type of thing happens. And on talking to him, his sister had been abused by his father. So he really understood right away what might be going on. And so, you know, he's, he was really supportive and understanding and accepting. And he said, 
you don't have to do all the poses we are going to do. And he and I talked about the ones in particular that were challenging. He said, well, do this instead. I won't call it out in the class, but we've talked about it. You know what to do. Um, it's no big deal. No one's going to care. And, and and we also talked about adjustment in the type of yoga that I have been doing for years, Iyengar. There's a lot of um, intentional adjustment by the teacher to help the student get into the pose properly. Um, it's all just part of the the... The, the practice. Yeah. And I let him know that I was not comfortable with that. And he goes, that's okay. I'll just not come adjust you. And I, you know, if you ever feel like you are okay with that, you can let me know, but I'll just do other students and I will just not call you out. And it was really important for me not to stick out. I felt like I was always afraid of being different and people knowing and people seeing me as different with all this shame and everything going on. So that was really important for me not to stand out because there was something wrong with me and I couldn't do what everyone else was doing in some way. He totally took that away and he was really supportive. And so I was very, very grateful that I had someone like that who understood and that I did go forward because otherwise I could have been forcing myself to do things that were re-traumatizing. And instead he shifted it and helped me get to a place I felt very safe. And eventually I was able to do those poses because I felt comfortable in my body and in the environment that I was in. But it, it took you know, being wanting something enough for myself that I was willing to kind of step to the edge of my comfort zone and maybe a little beyond to talk to him. But the response was amazing. And and I'm really grateful for him for doing that because I've been doing yoga for over 20 years now. And it's still an integral part of what I do and how I, I keep my body feeling good. Nice. I know I'm, I'm just, when I read that in the book, I was so grateful that you had that experience that, that you did speak up and that he would just responded in the, in the way that he did. And that that's now allowed you, as you said, to have this yoga practice for, for so many decades. And I mean, one of the other things you, you recommend as part of yoga in the book and, and what I want to second is finding something that is gentle and, mm-hmm. and this is important a lot as well because often the the people who are listening to this podcast are recovering from an eating disorder or disordered eating and and there is this relationship with exercise that can be about really pushing the limits and can be about using energy and calories and all of these different things And, and this is just the the opposite of what this is about this is very much about coming back into one's body about being present and so yeah I just want to want to mention that and say that that this isn't about finding some intense yoga practice or going and doing hot yoga or anything along those lines it's about something that is using movement in a specific way that then brings you back in connection with oneself yeah that's beautifully said Chris thank you for that because I there's a lot of different types of yoga and then you mentioned hot yoga or, you know, more aerobic Ashtanga yoga. I went with a practice by anger yoga because it just resonated with me. It's really based a lot on restorative poses and using props to help you get into poses when your body's not quite ready to go there. So instead of pushing yourself into something or pushing your body, it was how can I support my body to get into um, positions that will be nurturing and restorative for it. And it, there is a tendency to always try to, to push things a little too hard on ourselves. And this is was an act of self-care and self-compassion for myself to say, okay, this type of yoga is going to, to not um, take me to the edge. It's going to, like you said, do the opposite to help me slow down. And whether it's called gentle yoga or restorative yoga, you know, even chair yoga. I mean, if you need to start in a place and you're just not ready to do anything like that, you know, there's lots of stuff on YouTube. There's videos that you can purchase. There's classes you can go to and you can do things that are helpful for you without really feeling like you have to be like some, you know, some 110 pound, 20 year old (laughs) you see in a yoga, go there. You find what works for you. Yeah, definitely. And so you also talked about like other types of body work. So things like massage or Reiki or acupuncture, like how did you use these? Was this, was this a fairly regular thing? Was this intermittent? How, how was it for you? So the, the massage I think has been, it was pretty regular until COVID came along. But um, for me, massage was another way to have self-care and self-compassion for my body. I kept 
still do keep a lot of stress in my body, a lot of pain in my body, a lot of memories in my body. And so to do um, work with someone who, with the massage therapist who, again, not going for the intense Swedish massage, but the gentle massage to help me relax all of that tension and stress that I contained in my body that maybe I couldn't release through other means. And, you know, just have someone that could um, help me be comfortable with, you know, touch and sensitivity on my body in, in a, you know, professional way. That was important to me because I saw it as a treat to myself to help relax and help um, get out the aches and pains and be able to be comfortable with my body being gentle with it. It was another practice for me of being gentle with my body and really feeling good after you have that experience. So, you know, that's something that I hope to continue again when, when COVID kind of settles down, but that was important um, to know that instead of pushing myself to the edge, I would do something that would be really self-nurturing. Now the um, acupuncture um, for me, it was um, dealing with low energy and uh, again, blockage of energy flow that I felt it was very helpful to, again, be supportive of um, emotional and energetic levels because there's a lot of work that we do in our minds of trauma survivors to constantly be hypervigilant and waiting for the next bad thing to happen and all the energy we put into kind of protecting ourselves, even if it's subconscious, that's really draining really draining emotionally and even physically. And so the uh, things like Qigong or um, acupuncture was just a way that I was wanting to explore to see if I could have another way to build up my resilience and my energy reserve so that I could do the work that I wanted to do. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I second what you said there about the massage, where I think there is something healing with just getting yourself a massage like you're, you're doing something that is so nice for your body and even if I compare it to something like yoga you can enjoy yoga and yoga can be restorative but there's something very different when you're getting a massage and how relaxing that can be I mean once you get over the the um, aspects of I'm being touched by someone else and and whatever that brings up for you, there, there's something very pampering about getting a massage. And if you've come from a place where there has been so much self-hatred or self-loathing or that kind of thing, to then be getting regular massages is really sending a pretty clear message in the other direction. Yeah, for me, it was important to um, find a same-sex person, you know, so that that I was not able <laughs> or willing to go to a male that just was, was not going to work for me to not feel safe but being with a woman felt safe same yeah. thing when I went to find a therapist I would not have felt safe with the man at that time um, and I definitely went and, and sought out someone who was not the same sex as my perpetrator with the uh, yoga I would have preferred a female teacher from the beginning but um, it wasn't available at the studio where I was at. And so it turned out to be a wonderful experience because I, I had this experience with my male teacher that helped me not only get myself comfortable with doing the yoga, but it, having that relationship and that acknowledgement and that um, affirmation about my experience was healing in itself. Just that experience of working with a man and having that belief by him and that support by him was, was very healing. So you know, I think people can make the choice, whatever you're comfortable with, um, and be okay with having limits to what you can do when you're exploring these, these, these new areas. Yeah. If you can do something, but there's a certain limit, like for me, it was, I don't want a, a male masseuse, I want a female. Don't stop from doing something because you think it has to be a certain way. Look at what you want to try and say, how can I make it safe for me to do this? So that you can find a way to step into that, that you're going to be comfortable and that you don't have to push yourself beyond what you're comfortable with, but you can have that exploration in a safe way. Yeah. And so then med meditation. So meditation was something you said you've created quite a, a practice around. And so, yeah, how, how did that get started for you and, and how's that evolved over time? So I um, first started with guided meditations that I could purchase online or from different meditation instructors websites because I could not 
be still enough in my body or, or in my mind or be comfortable with what my mind would show up doing when I just try to sit still and, and listen to my breath or follow my breath. So for me, initially, the way that I could actually relax and get some of the benefit was through the guided meditation practices. And that's where I started was sort of by myself with these recordings to the point where I could start feeling that I could relax and feel safe with, in my own mind space, you know, because I had my fa- grandfather's voice telling me all these negative things about myself. I had turned into a perfectionist kind of to overcome that. So I had this perfectionist voice in my head driving me constantly with, no way of ever being successful because how can you ever be perfect? And so I didn't want to live in my own head very often. I kept very busy to avoid hearing those things. So God of Meditations gave me the first step into a place where I could do this on my own, in my own place and time and have someone kind of work with me and keep me in a safe place so that I could settle. And once I started getting to the point where my mind could feel safe to be in and be quiet, I really wanted to have an interaction in person and have some guidance from someone who was an expert. So I, at the time I started, I was living in Atlanta and I found a meditation center there, Buddhist meditation center, where I went and I got personal training. They, you know, they train you in meditation. They have group meditation sessions so you can go and sit with people. They had classes and events and really learned um, the process from that experience of how to work with my mind. It was a breath-based meditation, a compassionate meditation. And that slowly taught me how I could be okay to be in my own head and then also start to recognize when I had things come up. And when we talked about earlier about kind of peeling the onion, clearing the clouds, figuring out what's really going on, the meditation was really important for me to be able to see things clearly not with judgment, not with hatred, not with reflexivity and um, responsiveness to what had happened to me in the past, but to start to sit and just say, okay, what's going on in my head? What's really happening? Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why did I feel that way? Very gently and say, okay, how did that arise? How did that happen? Can I be more aware of what's happening and how I'm showing up in the world and reacting to the world. And if I can be more aware, maybe I can start to peel away some of these things that I don't want to do, or I don't want to tell myself. So it built an ability to be feel safe in my head. It built an ability to really understand what was happening in my mind and to make sort of that separation between what I might be feeling or thinking and what I would do with that. Can I let that go? Can, do I need to respond to this and have some discernment and have some ability to work with what was there rather than reacting to it? I wonder what meditation was like when you first started in, in terms of like these days, there's a, a million meditation apps. Meditation is very much thought of as <laughs> something that is just a thing that a lot of people do it's it's not that obscure but when you Mm -hmm. were starting this how kind of left field was the idea of meditation it was a little bit on the edge obviously but uh since i had been doing yoga i was kind of in that new age space yoga had at that point in time transitioned to being fairly mainstream not as much as it is now but it was fairly mainstream and it, it wasn't like boy you're really yeah, hippie kind of 60s person, if you do that, it was accepted that it was something people do. And yoga led me into meditation because yoga was really developed as a way to, to, to prepare your body to do meditation. That That's really how it's evolved over time. And so I was exposed to meditation and things in yoga, and it just seemed a natural progression to work with my mind. And um, by the time I got to the center, yeah, it, it, it was an environment that felt comfortable and it didn't feel really odd. And they were very open. I mean, we had people who were Christian and Jewish and all kinds of different religions that would come because the meditation practice is working with your mind. And people were coming there that wanted to work with your mind and maybe had other um, spiritual practices beyond that, but they recognized the benefit of working with their mind. And so it it felt like I found my peeps, (laughs) you know, these are my people that were interested in doing this. And so, um, it didn't feel especially strange. You know, now that you, like you said, you've got all these apps and everybody's kind of doing it. It it wasn't on the periphery, but it wasn't way out there. And I just, you know, I've always felt like I'm going to do what I'm going to do no matter what. You know, I I 
was always aware of part of me was concerned about what other people thought, but there was this drive I have always had that says, you know what? I want this. I want to go for this. I want to try this. I want to experience this. And to heck with what other people think. This is for me. And if it works for me, then that's what I'm going to do. (laughs) So that's kind of where I took it. I was fortunate in some ways because I had done so many years of yoga and yoga is not just working with your body. It's working with your mind as well. Um, that I had sort of gotten sort of a jump start on the meditation through doing the yoga. So I skipped a little bit of some of the challenges that came up when people first start doing yoga uh, meditation. Um, but I still had to go through a lot of the experience of having to get to a point where I could be a little quiet with my mind. But I, I'm just fabulously grateful for everything that's available to people that you can find in just one app. You can find all these different ways of doing yoga. You can find the guided meditations. You can find people just working with their breath. You know, there's all kinds of things that you can explore to help you figure out what's going to work for you. And a lot of people maybe have the misconception with meditation that it has to be something you do for long periods of time. Well, you know, one or two minutes a day, if you really are concentrated on being quiet and following your breath or doing whatever that practice is, that's going to be helpful. You talk about compounded interest. It's giving your brain a little bit of time every day, whatever that is. If it's just being quiet on your drive into work and focusing driving meditation or walking meditation or seated meditation, whatever it is, if you can just give yourself that gift of a few minutes, eventually you're going to love that experience so much it'll grow to a bigger time. So that's something important for people, your listeners to know. It doesn't have to be this marathon session, just a few minutes of your day in a quiet space, working with one of these um, types of meditation and just making that something consistently that you gift yourself, that's going to build up for you over time. Oh, I, I completely agree with that. And I, I've I've had various attempts at different meditations and different meditation apps. And, and what I find now more than anything is, as you described, something that is very short where maybe I'm out walking the dog in, in the morning and I'm like, I'm going to have five minutes where I'm just going to be very much in the present. I'm going to look around and see the clouds and the trees and everything, but I'm not going to be running away with my thoughts about um, what do I need to get done today? Okay. Let's think about that email I need to write. Like if that comes up, it's like not now. And just coming back to, to the present moment or when I'm hanging out with my, with my son and just being very much about being in the moment. And if I notice that my, my thoughts start to, to drift away from that, it's like kind of bringing myself back. And so I I think I've become much more about meditation in the real world as opposed Mm -hmm. to kind of meditation removed, sitting on a mat for for long stretches of time. Yeah, that's what we talk about is that the goal of meditation is not to be the perfect meditation practitioner on your cushion. You know, it's to develop your mind in a way you can take that mind space with you as you go out into the world and, and have that, like you said, present when you're with your son, present when you're walking with the dog. And it's being able to settle and not be pulled into the past or future. And sometimes it's not going to be possible, you know, depending on what's happening. But often what we can do is simply saying, what am I seeing? What are five things that I see? What am I smelling? What am I tasting? What am I feeling on my body? If it's my clothes or I'm you know, on a seat, just being in your body and exploring your senses rather than, you know, letting your thoughts run. Sometimes that's all you need to do so that you can settle down and be present and give that little space for a bit of time where you're focused on being here and not somewhere else. And so you don't even necessarily need an app. You can just say, okay, let me focus on my senses. And and that could get you in a space where you can settle. Yeah. And I'm also very conscious of doing it even when it feels like the thoughts that I'm having are happy thoughts. So even if I'm like daydreaming about a holiday I'm going to go on or a renovation I'd like to do to the house or or whatever it may be, and it feels like these are very happy thoughts that I'm having, I also want to be able to be like, no, this is still a good time for me to practice how to come back to the the present moment because I, I feel like I don't want to be only trying to do this when everything's gone to pot or where everything feels uh, like a real struggle. Like I want to be able to know how to do this whatever time of day. Oh, that's awesome. I, I like how you said that. 
because I'll, I know that myself being a survivor, sometimes these fantasy worlds are a great place to be because it's so painful to be where you are now emotionally. And so that can be a real challenge. But, and that's why I say these small moments, dipping in, dipping in, you know, just little moments throughout today can be helpful and exploring that. You don't have to force yourself to, to, to try to do it through a long period of time, through incredibly painful moments. But if you can dip into it and just explore it for a little bit and say, okay, take a few deep breaths, try to be present and then let it go. Because these practices of being present in your body, like the, the five senses practice or doing, you know, the box breathing where you breathe in for four, hold for four, breathe out for four and hold for four. Those are the kind of things that actually are encouraged when you're trying to deal with an an anxious moment or an anxiety moment, or when you've been triggered to get you in your body because the anxiety and the triggering is taking to you a place of fear and taking you to the future where it's unknown and you're, you're afraid of the outcome and your ability to handle it. But if we can get in our bodies and, you know, get to the space where we're present and grounded and here, then we connect with our resilience and our strength and we can step into the next phase. Yeah, definitely. And the, the box breathing is something that I got into more recently and has been phenomenal. Like I, I before we hit record, I was telling you I had a pretty difficult uh, end to last year with my, my wife was injured in a, in a horse accident. And yeah, we had a pretty dark couple of months dealing with everything. And I found that whenever... I was having high amounts of anxiety or things were really feeling difficult. If I could do some box breathing, even for, for three minutes, five minutes, like it wouldn't take everything away, but it would make a significant shift in me and a, a shift bigger than I would have imagined before doing the box breathing. Mm-hmm. Like I, I do think that sometimes when you're in those moments, it can feel like this thing's not going to make a difference. Uh, like this is too big, it's too overwhelming, it's too hard, something like this is not going to make a difference. And actually what I found more recently is, yeah, doing some box breathing does make more of a difference than I would have anticipated. Or having a a five-minute conversation with my wife about something I'm struggling with, it makes more of a difference than I would have imagined before, before doing that. Yeah, and sometimes people hear something, they go, well, that's too easy, that's too simple. Yep. What I'm trying to deal with is too big. It's too complicated. And it's like sometimes the best solutions are the simple solutions. And yep. the best solution is what solution you use, right? So some yep. of these solutions are simple, but that's where their power is because they're easy to remember to do more frequently than some of uh, some other techniques. They're easy to remember to do, and they're easy to do in the moment when your resources are so stretched thin that you wouldn't be able to mentally handle doing something that would be more complicated. And so the yeah. simplicity is the beauty and grace of these practices to do the box breathing, to just say, I have five senses. Let me check in with my five senses. Let me come in. Um, that's how they have their power is the simplicity of what they offer you. Yeah. And even if it only reduces it by 50%, you're in a like 50% better off. And then it allows you to then do the next thing afterwards, which is, okay, cool. I now do need to go and do that thing to make food or to clean up the house thing or, or whatever it may be. But it just then changes the state that you're in that then allows you to then move forward. Yeah, it gives you this sense of possibility. It, yeah. it diminishes the overwhelm enough where you can say, I may not have the solution to everything that's going on or even this big thing, but I at least can see far enough down the road of, of what the next step is. And yeah. then when I get there, I'll be able to do the next step. You know, for me, overwhelm is a big issue and, and whether it's personal life or work life or, the, you know, how everything comes together. And I, when I get in that place of overwhelm, I just say, okay, break it down. What is the next step you can take? towards wherever you need to go to get out of the space and move forward. You just have to do one thing. You don't have to solve the big problem. And that, you know, we kind of get in this all or none thinking. And for me, it's what can I do right now? What practice can I do right now to breathe and to tell myself, you can figure this out. You know, you, you've done this before. You figured these things out. You're going to figure it out. But what is the first step that you can take to deal with the situation now? And then the rest of it, you'll figure out as it comes. So I don't need to have to solve the entire problem. I just need to get centered and figure out what should I do now as the next first step. Yeah. And you talk also in the book about like contemplation practices. And so was this 
did this come out of the meditation that you were learning? Well, it, it, it came out in the sense that I was given the opportunity to experience it when I was at the meditation center. So some of what they do at the meditation center is contemplative practices and often their art practices like Ikebana, which is flower arranging, tea ceremony, various things. And what I got connected with was contemplative photography. So it was a contemplative practice about connecting directly in the moment with what you're experiencing, what you're perceiving visually, and just using your cameras to capture it. And it really is about slowing down and releasing any agenda or judgment about what you're experiencing and what you're seeing, just accepting it for what it is and really connecting with your experience visually and appreciating what's showing up. And then we just use the camera to kind of capture that and share that. And for me, I, I had had a love of photography um, from earlier in my life and, you know, was a real visually based person. And this practice, instead of turning inward with meditation where you're exploring your own mind, this was flipping it around and exploring outward. But from that same sort of centered, calm, open, um, aware space yeah. that my, my mind isn't controlling the situation. My mind is simply there to receive what is happening and what I'm experiencing. And it opened up so much of the beauty of the world to be able to slow down and see it in this new way brought a richness to my life that I absolutely loved. And I loved the experience so much that I actually was certified to train it. And now I teach um, other people how to have this experience, which is wonderful to be able to do. But it was a complement to the meditation and, and in a way that was very enriching because it was doing something with a camera that I loved, opening myself up to the beauty of the world and really allowing myself to appreciate the beauty and let that in. That it was kind of like shining a light in and helping yeah. bring more beauty into my life in a way that was very nurturing. And I also know you you talked about creative expression and for like a child of abuse they're, they're often forced to grow up quickly even to the point of like denying the their their child or childhood themselves and and then doing art or creative activities can then help to reconnect to that child self absolutely I, and that's one of the sad things looking back to see what had happened to me as a kid I mean I wrote poetry even when I was young and short stories and was real creative and I wasn't always a very good artist you know sorry the the what I thought an artist should be right um but it was something that was so expressive and that just got completely shut down and to be able to tap into that and be playful to feel safe enough to be playful and explore maybe make some mistakes um maybe make something that doesn't match what my expectation was but the process was what is fun and and so that was incredibly healing for me through the, the contemplative arts and the photography and just taking classes. Hey, I want to take a pottery class. Hey, I want to try watercolor. Hey, I want to you know, do something in this space. And being able to be open to have fun doing it and be playful. And again, let that child come out and, and have that childlike experience. I don't think anybody who is an adult gives themselves that opportunity enough, not just uh, trauma survivors, but for us in particular, it's telling that child it's safe to be where you are and who you are and be expressive and playful and explore. It's okay. You know, I, I'm here. I can protect you. We can do this together and you can have fun and enjoy and you don't have to be worried about any negative consequences. This is just for us, for us. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I, I recommended Liz Gilbert's Big Magic to clients mm -hmm often because I think it's a, a great book she's got a, a fantastic TED talk that it, it feels like the book was was based upon uh there's a book drawing on the right side of the brain which I really love and so yeah I I'm uh, I, I'm in agreement with you that no matter who you are as an adult most of the time we are not spending enough time with play and with creative expression and those things feel like oh, there's something that you do when you're when you're a kid and I'm a serious adult and I don't have time for this. And the, the, they are just so important for us all through our life. It, it's not just a kid thing. Yeah, I mean, there's this whole study um, area now about play and how, yeah. how important it is. And I think also these expressive arts tap into a side of our brain that we don't normally live in when yeah. we're a, a trauma survivor because you know the, the analytical overthinking brain over analyzing brain is highly active and responsive we got the 
you know, the emotional fear-based brain kind of driving things. And instead, if we can tap into this other side of our body where we're not engaging the analytical part of the brain and we're able to open up to other emotional experiences beyond fear, that it gives us a way to really expand into being a full person and being able to not over-criticize or over-judge ourselves, but be able to settle into a place where we can be a whole person and and have fun and have seriousness. You know, we want both sides of the coin. And being a full human doesn't mean only being joyful and getting rid of negativity. You know, and, and that's something we have to learn as, as trauma survivors on our healing journey that being human means that sometimes we're going to have grief and fear and sadness and there might be a little bit of shame there, but th- those don't have to be the driving, overwhelming emotions that dictate how we're living our lives. They're just one part of the full spectrum of experience that we want to be able to have as a human being because that's what we're here for. That's how we relate to other people and can have compassion and empathy and sympathy for other people and ourselves. We want to be able to have the full range, but not get stuck on one end like we have been as survivor, we want to shift from that to have the full spectrum. Yeah, definitely. And so look, th- there are more things in the book as, as part of your, your healing journey in terms of modalities, but I, I think I want to move on and spend a bit of time talking about the section in the book, which is figuring it out and moving forward. And, and this is about asking difficult questions to help move beyond the, the effect of the abuse. And, and you talk about asking the questions of like, who knew? And and so can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, for me, it was important to kind of figure that piece out because I I felt like I wasn't protected as a child, that this happened to me. Where were the people that were supposed to to help me? Who knew and could have happened, could have helped when it was happening? Because I knew that my cousin knew. She had revealed that to me. And for a long time, I struggled with that because I was in some ways resentful that she didn't say anything to help me to make it stop. But in hindsight, as I got older and looked back, I thought, oh, my gosh, Denise, look where you were in high school. Could you have done anything in that situation? So I knew so that she knew, but I I was just wanting to understand for myself, was, did my parents know? Did my grandmother know? I mean, who, who knew about what was going on and could have maybe stepped in? I mean, there was opportunities when I was in school when he died. My grades, I was always a straight A student and my grades started sliding. And there was a one teacher in particular, I always remember a history teacher who just berated me in front of the class of that I was being lazy and, and I needed to get my grades up and what was going, you know, why wasn't I putting full effort into it? And there was this missed opportunity. If she had brought me aside and said, what's going on? I know you're a straight A student. There's obviously something happening. What's going on? There could have been a wonderful opportunity for someone to step in and provide some healing. So there was, you know, and a need for myself to understand who knew what when, because I needed to figure out, you know, more of a timeline of what was happening, um, more of an understanding of the, the family dynamics to see why it might have happened because I was learning that it wasn't my fault, but I kind of needed more information for myself to step into that space of it wasn't your fault. Um, And then, of course, part of that was going to be, well, if these people possibly could have known, do I need to talk to them about it? (laughs) Do you want to have conversations about it? Do I want to keep them out of my life because they didn't step up and support me when that happened? You know, figuring out who might have known and then deciding well, from here, what more do I need to know from them? And what kind of relationship do I want to have with them if they did know? You know, I, I have some decisions to make. I have decisions to make about what to do with this information and in particular, what I would do with these people in my life. Now, for me, my grandfather died when I was young, obviously, so I didn't have to deal with him on an ongoing basis, but I still had to make a decision about the relationships that I had in my life and the people that were there when the abuse happened and what I wanted to do in relation to those people going forward. And I remember you, I mean, we started this conversation talking about the the Larry Nassau case or, or mentioned it in passing and you saying that that had actually helped you because in that situation with, with Larry Nassau, there, there were parents in the room when the abuse oh. was going on and he was yes. just shielding that by putting his body in the way so that they were unable to see it. And so I guess 
as you talk about, like there's a sense of here's a situation where a parent is literally feet from the abuse occurring and yet they were unable to to see what was going on. And, and so for you where you were being dropped off with your uncle for the summer and your parents were away, like that that's a whole different situation and, and it gave you, I don't know, a, a change in your perspective. Yeah, it was a way to kind of let go of any lingering um, resentment. Um, I had I had made earlier than that recognition. I had made a decision to you know keep my parents in my life and my my family in my life, even my grandmother. And I didn't really talk too much about the abuse with them. I never mentioned the abuse to my my grandmother, but I saw how she blossomed and changed after my grandfather died, and I got to know her better. And she was a wonderful woman. And for me, it was, I don't want to live in the past and keep focused on what happened in the past because that gave my grandfather the power over my life. I was a survivor in response to what happened to me. And I really wanted to shift away from that into thriving. And does it excuse any um, lack of action by the people who might have done something? No, it doesn't excuse it. But I wanted to move beyond that. I said, again, I want to look forward. I want to see, is this a person that outside of anything in the past that happened, is this a person that I would want in my life now as they are? Yes. She was a beautiful woman. And I was really nurtured by the fact that she was in my life as an adult. Same thing with my parents. They're two of my best friends. We talk all the time. And I would have missed out on all of those experiences going forward as an adult in that relationship if I had hit onto resentment. You know, and that's, but that's each person's individual choice that my choice was what I made it may not be the choice that you make as a survivor with all of the people in your life that might have known or did know or with any of them it's your choice and I can't emphasize it more strongly that all of these things are your choice do you confront your abuser I have a whole section on that I, I did not confront my abuser I didn't have to deal with it but I talked to folks in my book about how you want to think about that. Talk to your therapist if it's the right thing. What are you expecting to get out of this situation by confronting? But everyone needs to think about it and make a decision that makes the best sense for you and not just, you know, do it unthoughtfully or in reaction. And it may take some processing and it may take a lot of thought, but make the choice for yourself and acknowledge that I am doing this with this relationship because I want what's good out of it, or I am going to stop this relationship because it doesn't serve me. It's negative and toxic, and I'm going to end the relationship. But everyone needs to evaluate that, clear thinking over time, and then you make your choice. Don't let other people tell you what you should do or how you should live your life in relationship with these people that were involved in some way or knew in some way or not. That's the choice that we each get to make for ourselves because now we're in control of our lives in those relationships. Yeah. Yeah. And and you talk a lot in the book about forgiveness and obviously forgiveness can mean different things for different people. So one, like, what do you mean when you use the term forgiveness and also what is, what, what things have you either read or listened to or, or what helped to kind of inform that perspective on forgiveness? So that's a, a trigger word, (laughs) you know, a really tough word for a lot of survivors. And let me be clear, forgiveness doesn't mean you have to forgive the abuser for what they did to you. No, that's not what I'm talking about. They did something absolutely horrible they should never have done. And there is no excuse for that for them. So forgiveness for me is not towards the abuser. Forgiveness for me was really mainly about forgiving myself letting go of the shame and the blame and the self-hatred that I carried for so long about that I was responsible, that I drew that, that I brought that on myself, that I deserved that in any way. I forgave myself for being the type of person that he wanted to control and that he decided he could get away with hurting. I forgave myself for being a child and having no resources or strength or power or uh, capability of, of defending myself in that situation. I forgave myself for being human and I forgave myself for the things that I did behaviorally after that in response to the horrible things that happened to me. And I I forgave myself for not being the person that could heal before I started my healing. You know, I forgave myself for being human, you know, and just 
said, you know, it, it, you did the best you could. You couldn't do anything at the beginning. You did the best you could for a while. And now you know where you can go to really heal and be the person you want to be. And you have the power to do that. Now, some of the, I don't know if, you know, forgiving my parents for making mistakes, for not being there when they should, they did the best they could at the time. My God, when, you know, 20 years ago, what did we know about this kind of thing? Yeah. What did we understand? What was available? What resources were available for them to understand? You know, we can think of it in our present moment understanding and what we, they should have, could have, would have done. But that happened years ago. And so it was different then. Um, and I, I feel sorry for them because they carry the, the burden of knowing that they failed in that place. And that's a burden that, that haunts them. But that doesn't keep us from having a relationship moving forward. So forgiveness is really about inward focusing to yourself and saying, it's okay. You did the best you could. And now we're going to see where we can go from here. Yeah, definitely. And this is one of the aspects of what I liked about Beverly Engel's book, It Wasn't Your Fault, is that there are so many different parts that allow or help someone get to that, to that place of self-forgiveness and mm-hmm. looking at all of the different distortions that can then start to happen because of the abuse that mean that you do feel like I should have done something differently, whether that's I should have done something differently at the time of the abuse or I should have done something differently with my life since the abuse. And so, yeah, I I think both your book and also hers is is a really good resource for helping someone to start to to move towards that place. And you can just tell yourselves, I can always start now. Yeah. I'm starting here. I'm starting now. It's never too late to be able to live a life of joy and freedom from the things that have really been keeping you from thriving, you can start now. And I really encourage anyone. That's when I wrote my book, it was for all ages, men and women. I I hope it finds people who are younger simply because they can start their healing earlier and they can live more years of being free and, and, and being in their full selves. But it's really anytime it, anyone can do the healing because now's the right time for them. So don't feel like it's too late ever, ever, ever start now with that first step. Definitely. And I also like the way that in the end of the book, you also acknowledge that after all the work that you've done, that things will still shake you up. Like that, this isn't that you do it and then it's completed or that you, you do it and you lose your, your human side. Like we, we are all humans. We all have times of struggle. We'll all have things that trigger us, even for someone who hasn't had abuse, will trigger you to be that four-year-old again or that seven-year-old again or take us back to, to times when we were younger or, or trigger something in us that we don't even know what it was, but there is something there. And, and so I think that was really helpful for you to say that, this is, despite the fact that you've been doing this for so long, this is something that is ongoing. And I don't want that to be something people will go, well, why should I even start? Hell, no. you, know? <laughs> you know, to me, it's like, okay, being a human means that you, you always are going to have things come up that challenge you, that um, push you, that lead you a, a, to a place where you need to grow and explore. So that to me is what a human being is. We're, we're constantly growing and exploring. And if we offer that to ourselves, we continue to expand ourselves in all ways, mentally, physically, emotionally. For survivors, it's kind of like you have this really big hill to climb and get over before you enter the land of normal human being where there's ups and downs. You know, so you got to get over this huge hill that, you know, we have all this extra stuff we got to go through. But even after you get over that, okay, you know, the dog comes in and, and goes to the bathroom in the house. You know, your car gets a flat tire. The, there's a problem at work. There's always going to be something challenging you. But what we're hoping for is that we get to a place where we get the resilience and the skills where these things don't send us into a, a head spin and not being able to get out of bed for four weeks. It's something that we say, OK, yes, I'm touched by this. It's impact me. I'm angry. I'm upset. I'm frustrated. But then we can say, um, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling upset, I'm feeling frustrated. And then you can get to the point where you're saying, you know, this is a really frustrating situation and I recognize that and then you can move beyond it. You know, so we're building the ability, the capability, the resilience where these things that used to take over our lives and 
you know, tap into all those triggering emotions and, and mental experiences. Now we're saying, hey, yes, I am feeling this, but I have a choice on how I'm going to react and I can let this emotion come through and I can move on from that and acknowledge it and say, okay, yep, this is a really frustrating situation, but I'm not going to let it take over. Let me see what I can do with it. Um, or, you know, I see something that triggers me and takes me back to that moment of abuse. It's like, okay, but, but I'm not that person. I'm not that small child. My grandfather is not here to hurt me anymore. Yes, that that's a memory that's always going to be there in me. And sometimes things are going to bring that forward, but I'm not there anymore. I'm here. And that's a part of my life as much as any memory of going to the, the local swimming pool or eating ice cream in the summer with my friends. You know, that can be tapped into sometimes. Those are all experiences I've had that have led me to be who I am. And so I acknowledge and welcome them. But at the same time, I say, I'm not going to let things take over when I do have those things happen. I'm just going to use the tools that I have and the resilience and strength I have to move forward into being in that space I want to live in. Yeah. Well, look, Denise, thank you so much for for this conversation and and for your wonderful book. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you that you wanted to chat about today? Uh, I think we've covered quite a bit. You know, again, people may say, oh, we hear this all the time, but I'm just going to repeat it again. It was not your fault. You deserve to be loved. You deserve the life you want to live. And you deserve to find the ways that work for you to heal. Give that gift to yourself. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for for doing what you do, for writing the book and and for delivering that message to others because I I think it will be very healing. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the time. So that was my conversation with Denise. If you have experienced sexual abuse, then I highly recommend checking out her book, Thriving After Sexual Abuse. And for everyone else, I hope that you're still able to take a lot from this conversation about the possibilities for change and transformation and the healing powers of many different types of modalities and and practices. So I want to make a recommendation of something to check out. It's a TV special called In and of Itself by Derek Delgadio. And I'm on Tim Ferriss's mailing list, his, his Five Bullet Friday email list. And it was one of the things that he included on that list. And I clicked on it. I watched the trailer and was instantly intrigued and just started to search out how to watch the full show. So Delgadio is a magician and a performance artist. And it's this combination of one-man show, magic, storytelling. And it really is just this thing of of stunning beauty. I actually don't know how to describe everything that happens. And I also don't want to say too much about it because I think the less you know about it, the better. And I don't think there's any harm in watching the trailer and it's not going to ruin anything. It'll give you a bit of a sense of what it's about. So I will link to that in the show notes, but you can also just Google in and of itself and it will come up. But what I will say is that it's been a couple of weeks since I watched it and my mind still keeps coming back to it. And I have no idea how he does what he does. And he just has this real craft for bringing the whole narrative together. And the fact that David Blaine and Bill Gates are in the audience in this fairly small theatre as part of the show is probably a fair indication of his talent. It was also interesting when I was looking up info about Delgadio after watching the show and that I found that he was consulted for the film The Prestige. So The Prestige is one of my favourite films of all time and probably my favourite Christopher Nolan film. And if you haven't watched it, then I highly recommend you do. But it was just interesting finding out this fact because it made a lot of sense that he would be somewhat connected to that film. So In and of Itself was released on Hulu. Uh, So wherever you are in the world and can get access to Hulu, that's how you can see it. In the UK, I signed up to Disney Plus uh, simply to to watch it. That was the only way that I could access it. And it was definitely worth the $7.99 for the month of Disney Plus to be able to see it. So it's called In and of Itself. It's incredible and you need to see it. 
So that is it for this week's episode. As I mentioned at the top, I've reopened my practice again to new clients. If you want help with an eating disorder or disordered eating, chronic dieting, poor body image, exercise compulsion, getting your period back, or or really any of the topics that I cover as part of this show, then please reach out. You can head to 7-health.com forward slash help for more information. I'll be back next week with another episode. Take care and I'll catch you then.